Greetings again in the Saviour's precious name to another Glad Tidings Hour program. We're glad that you've found us, whether it's on the website or on YouTube or on our Glad Tidings Hour Facebook. Whichever way you follow us, you're very, very welcome. We've got a program today that has got a special focus and it is on revival and we're going to have some of that in our songs. We're going to have it in our uh, special featured uh, part of the program with uh, Yvonne, my wife, and then in the message a little later on. But let's get started today with a great song and it's by a good friend of ours who lives in Scotland. Her name is Anita McDonnell and she has been singing on our program on previous occasions and she's singing a song that she wrote herself some time ago, Spring of Living Water. So here we go with the opening song on Glad Tidings, our program today. There's a spring of living water in my spirit. There's a spring of living water in my soul There's a spring of living water overflowing It's the Holy Spirit taking control It's a spring of living water for our churches It's a spring of living water for the soul it's a spring of living water for our families It's the Holy Spirit taking control There's a spring of living water steady pouring There's a spring of water rushing through my soul of living water in abundance It's the Holy Spirit taking control Oh, it's a spring of living water of salvation It's a spring of living water cleansing souls It's a spring of living water of revival it's the Holy Spirit taking control There's a spring of living water bringing healing There's a spring of living water bringing joy There's a spring of living water so refreshing it's the Holy Spirit taking control Yes, it's a spring of living water with such power It's a spring of water delivering souls It's a spring of living water strong and mighty It's the Holy Spirit taking control there's a spring of living water in my spirit There's a spring of living water in my soul There's a spring of living water overflowing It's the Holy Spirit taking control It's the Holy Spirit Taking control. Well, Jesus said that his life and his spirit dwelling within us would be like a spring of living water springing up into everlasting and eternal life. And it's great to have an inner spring, isn't it? And uh, the Bible says, indeed the psalmist it was who said, All my springs are in thee. And all our springs today are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's been a good start to our program. And we want to follow that up with another uh, very, very relevant song. Come Holy Spirit. The singers this time is the McAllister family. 
course, many of you will know that they were a great missionary family, especially Bob and Alma McAllister, who are now gone home to be with the Lord. But the ministry and work of missions is carried on through their children and their families even to this day. We rejoice in that. But here's a great song. And any work that is done and anything that is really accomplished, it is by the power and ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next part of our program when I ask Mrs. Stewart to come and share with us just after this song. revival in Ulster. When I was just 11 years old, a visiting minister came to our church in Carrickfergus, County Antrim, to speak on the Ulster Awakening of 1859. It was the 100th anniversary of the 59 revival in Ulster, and the preacher was Dr. John T. Carson, who at that time was a minister in Trinity Presbyterian Church in Bangor. He was the writer of a book on the revival called God's River in Spate. I was so impressed that I went to our local library where I found it and read it from cover to cover. That was my first exposure to revival in the true sense of the word. I have never written or spoken on the subject, but I plan to take a few weeks to deal very briefly with some of the outpourings of God's Spirit here in Britain, praying that you too will be challenged. Spiritual life in Ulster prior to the revival was at a low ebb across every denomination. Deadness, formality and indifference characterise many church members. Could that be said of our churches today? 
One minister said about his congregation, the condition of the church was deplorable. The people seemed dead to God, formal, cold, prayerless and worldly. Twice he tried to have a prayer meeting with his elders, but failed. After the fifth or sixth night, he was left alone. Another said he had preached the gospel faithfully for 11 years, but did not know of one conversion. However, news of a great spiritual awakening in America was filtering through. So great was the interest in the American movement that at the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, held in Dublin in 1858, two ministers were appointed to visit North America to see the work firsthand. They came back reporting what they had witnessed of the amazing outpouring of God's Spirit across the Atlantic. Ulster's fallow ground was about to be broken up as floods of God's blessing soon engulfed the whole of Ulster. Meanwhile, in the village of Kells, just three miles from Ballymena in County Antrim, four young men, whose lives had been wonderfully changed by God's power, met together for prayer and Bible study. Every Friday evening of the winter of 1857 to 1858, they would gather an armful of peat or turf to light a fire in the old schoolhouse while they studied God's word and poured out their hearts aflame with first love for their Lord and Saviour. Those prayers brought down unquenchable fire from heaven which set Ulster alight and at least 100,000 souls were saved in the next year. Now here's a photograph of the old schoolhouse at Kells, which is now uh, two dwelling houses. And this one shows Jeremiah Meyer or Jerry McNeely, now in later years. He was one of the four young men who started that revival prayer meeting. The prayer meeting started in the autumn of 1857 and continued for three months. Two more men joined the four and then on New Year's Day, that was 1858, the first conversion took place as a result of their prayers. By the end of the year, about 50 young men were coming to pray. As the revival tide rose, the old schoolhouse was crowded out and the young converts were sought after by mission halls and churches to tell what God had done for them. Churches in the district began to fill for both morning and evening services with prayer meetings in between in houses, in schoolrooms and even the large floor of a factory. Earnest cries went up for the Spirit of God to soften hearts, create faith and bestow peace and joy through salvation. There was no new doctrine just a pleading with God for mercy and favour. Conviction of sin was deep and real. People started to cry for mercy as preachers warned them to flee from the wrath to come. Confronted by the remedy for sin, the finished work of Christ on the cross, they looked to him, the only one who could deliver them. Emotions ranged from abject fear of death and eternity in hell to the joy of forgiveness and peace with God being experienced by the young converts. Their faces shone with a sweetness and glory beyond description. Now let me tell you a little about the town of Portrush on the beautiful north coast of Ulster where we have lived for most of our lives. A remarkable feature of the awakening in Portrush was the great revival open air meetings. One of these was at Dunmull Hill, about four miles outside the town. Although the population of Portrush in those days was just around 900 people, 6,000 gathered on the hill to hear Evangelist Brownlow North. Now here he is in this photograph, Brownlow North, a mighty evangelist seemingly. And some of the young men from Kells, 
would preach God's word. The Presbyterian and Church of Ireland ministers of Portrush were united in their zeal for souls, having witnessed what God was doing in the nearby town of Balamoney. Sermons and prayers were calm, simple and biblical, yet many were stricken down with deep conviction of sin and agony of soul, leading to deep, lasting experiences of salvation. In another area, a minister recorded, Went at 11am to such and such a town. Many converted last night during an all night of prayer and weeping. Many careless men left their corn sowing and potato planting and crowded the house, several under the power of the Spirit, while I was speaking. Ministers and elders were called to deal with the stricken sinners. Prayer meetings were numerous at all hours of the day and night. The Presbyterian magazine of June 1859 records, It is not unusual to see thousands assembled for prayer in a graveyard or gravel pit. Churches were crowded every night for prayer meetings. Persistent prevailing prayer was the forerunner of every area where the revival broke out. John Wesley said, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. The burning conviction which gripped the four young men in the Kells schoolhouse drove them to their knees in travailing and eventually prevailing prayer. They were convinced that what God had done through George Mueller, he would do and he could do for them if they learned the secret of true intercession. One minister recorded, I have thrown my whole soul into this great work so that night and day I have been engaged in labouring for the spiritual benefit of souls. The general effect upon society is most wonderful. Profanity, Sabbath breaking and drunkenness are set aside. Many public houses are closed. A cockpit has become a preaching station. Many who hated the gospel and were unwilling to listen are now rejoicing in Jesus. Crime was greatly reduced. Six months after the revival started, the number of prisoners on trial at the County Antrim Quarter Sessions was exactly half of the previous year. Six months later, there wasn't a single case on record. When asked why this had happened, the barrister, magistrates and grand jurymen all said it was because of the revival. Local and national newspapers reported on the moral change that had taken place in the country. The revival made drunkards to be sober, publicans to leave their accursed trade, profligates to repent, worldlings to turn from pleasure to serve the living and true God. But all classes of people were saved. The highly educated, along with the illiterate. Business people and servants. Rich and poor. Nor were children excluded. God moved in school classrooms and children became instruments to lead their friends and families to the Lord. Churches became inadequate to accommodate all those wanting to attend the services so that many churches were extended and new ones built. Passionate prayer, faithful preaching of God's word and jubilant praise became the order of the day. The favourite hymn of the revival was Whene'er we meet, you always say, what's the news? What's the news? Pray, what's the order of the day? What's the news? Oh, I have got good news to tell. My Saviour has done all things well and triumphed over death and hell. That's the news. That's the news. And it goes on, the Lamb was slain in Calvary. That's the news to set a world of sinners free. T'was there his precious blood was shed. T'was there he bowed his sacred head. But now he's risen from the dead. That's the news. The Lord has pardoned all my sin. That's the news. I feel the witness now within, and since he took my sins away and taught me how to watch and pray, I'm happy now from day to day. That's the news. 
and Christ the Lord can save you too. That's the news. Your sinful heart he can renew. This moment, if for sins you grieve, this moment, if you do believe, a full acquittal you'll receive. That's the news. And now, if anyone should say, what's the news? Oh, tell them you've begun to pray, that you have joined the conquering band, and now with joy at God's command, you're marching to the better land. That's the news. That's the news. But today I'm repeating a song by Horace Govan, which Mildred sang for us on last week's programme, as I feel it is so appropriate to finish this short report. If you would like to read more about the 59 Revival, I would recommend books like Through Editor's Eyes by Samuel Adams of the Every Home Crusade or The 59 Revival by Dr. A. N. R. K. Paisley, Heaven Came Down, The Ulster Awakening by John Weir, 1859 Revival by Dr. Stanley Barnes, to mention but a few. And now, Mildred will come and sing Visit Us, Lord, with Revival, stricken with coldness and death. Where is our hope of survival, save in thy life-giving breath? Visit us, Lord, with revival, stricken with coldness and death. Where is our hope of survival, saving thy life-giving breath? Lord, send us revival, let it begin now in me. Gladly dethroning each rival, I yield my heart now to Thee. The world in its proud exaltation, lust of the flesh and the eye, bent on the soul's desecration, God and His people defy. Turning aside into byways, letting their ardor grow cold. Many are leaving the highways, trod by our fathers of old. Lord, send us revival, let it begin now in me. Gladly dethroning each rise. to thee. Oh, for the breath of the Spirit, oh, for the might of his sword, leading us on to inherit all that in Jesus is stored. Surely it's time for revival, surely soon dawneth the day. Soon shall we hail its arrival, chasing the shadows away. Lord, send us revival, let it begin now in me. Gladly dethroning each rival, I yield my heart now to Thee. Gladly dethroning each rival, I yield my heart now to thee. Now, wasn't that a stirring account on the Ulster Awakening? And I'm sure you're wide awake after listening to that. May the Lord bless it to your heart and set you on a search to read more and to seek. God's blessing upon your own soul, that you too might be used as a channel of blessing and indeed in revival. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that is quite relevant to what we have been just listening to. And it's the prophet Ezekiel and the chapter is 47 and I'm reading about Ezekiel's vision of the supernatural river. 
So here we go. Verse 1. Ezekiel says, Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. That's the house of God. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me, and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi, even unto En Eglim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof, and the marishes thereof, shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. We shall conclude our Bible reading there at verse 12, and trust that God will add his own blessing to his own precious and inspired word. Well, let's just have a short prayer before we come to the message today. Thank you today, Lord, that you are the God of revival. And we recognize today that God is sovereign in revival. And yet we know, Lord, that in your word you have commanded us to pray and earnestly cry out to God. And we thank you, Lord, today that the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man or indeed a woman availeth much. And so we do ask that again you would be pleased to visit our land and nation and pour out your Spirit in revival blessing. Bless your word today, Lord, we pray, and continue to speak to us through this program, for Jesus' sake and glory. Amen. I've called my message today, The River of Blessing. And it's taken from Ezekiel chapter 47, and those 12 verses that we read a little while ago. Verses 5 and 6 read like this. The waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that I could not pass over. Son of man, hast thou seen this? There are three significant features which appear regularly throughout the Bible. They are a river, a tree, and a garden. And if we took every reference that you could find in the scripture, we would have a large body of teaching material and rich ministry for our lives, 
all the way from the book of Genesis to the book of the Revelation, these three wonderful, significant features appear again and again. And today we're going to spend a little time looking at Ezekiel's glorious vision of a river. There's a context to the prophet's vision, and I want to give you that just in a brief overview of Ezekiel's prophecy. Ezekiel has been taken captive in 597 BC, 11 years before the fall of Jerusalem to the armies of Babylon in 586 BC. 32 chapters of this book are predominantly made up with warnings or of impending judgment that was coming to the city. Chapters 33 to 38 are promises of a future and a hope for Israel, even though taken captive in the final assault on Jerusalem. Chapters 40 to 48 form one major section of the book in which God gives his servant Ezekiel a revelation of things yet to happen in Israel. The vision of the living waters flowing from the holy precincts of Jerusalem, from the house of God to the Dead Sea, have yet to happen. But the day of fulfillment will come. In the larger view of the scriptures, there's more to this passage than a historic vision and a future literal fulfillment. There is a secondary application, and it is that, that spiritual application, that I want to feature and focus on now. That personal relevance, that spiritual application to your life and to mine. There is life in the Spirit, significance to this chapter. It was Dr. Barclay Buxton, who was one of the early founding men of the Japan Evangelistic Band, who said, This is a picture of the Holy Spirit in His power and blessedness and what He may mean to you. There are some of you perhaps today who can remember the Reverend Maynard James, that wonderful the saintly, godly Welsh preacher, and he said on one occasion, these waters are clearly a picture of the Spirit-filled life. Some months ago, Mrs. Stewart featured Frances Bottom in one of her hymn writers' uh, features in our programs in Glad Tidings Hour. Frances Bottom wrote a beautiful hymn, and the first verse goes like this. Beneath the glorious throne above, a crystal fountain springing, a river full of life and love, is joy and gladness bringing. O fount of cleansing flowing free, that fount is opened wide to me. I think it was Ezekiel 47 that must have given inspiration to this great hymn, and I will make some reference to it even as we continue in the message today. But from the context of the vision that we have in this chapter, I want us to dwell now for a little while on the properties of the river. The source of Earth's great rivers has often been the inspiration for great adventures. Where do the Amazon and the Nile and the Danube and the Yangtze rivers rise? Those Magnificent and well-known rivers? Well, the answer generally is that some insignificant unseen spot, perhaps on the side of some distant mountain range, actually the great Yangtze River, the largest, longest river in Asia, rises in Tibet and flows out to the southeastern China Sea. Ezekiel is transported to an entirely different source for his river vision. It is from the throne of God, from the presence of the Holy One at the altar within the sanctuary. We find that in the first verse of the Bible reading that we had today. And so much could be said regarding the God's manner of breaking forth into the arena of our lives. What lengths he has gone to what channels he has pursued to make himself real and 
reachable and recognizable in our everyday lives. Indeed, in sending his only begotten Son into our world, uh, being incarnate and coming to uh, Bethlehem's manger, and we'll be thinking about that in uh, just a very few weeks' time, and then to go all the way to Calvary's cross and suffer and bleed and die in your place and mine, and then again to rise and return to the Father's right hand, and in his place to send the blessed Holy Spirit to make himself real and reachable and recognizable in our everyday lives. Oh yes, the Lord has done everything that needs to be done to make the river life of God available to us and in our souls. And then from that to lead us onward and make our hearts his living temples or his dwelling place where he begins and carries forward his ever-developing purpose and will and plan in us, a plan that reaches to eternity. So what are some of the properties of the river of God? Well, the river imparts life that is divine. As you read this passage in Ezekiel chapter 47, time and again the prophet speaks of the vitality wherever the river flowed. We read words like these, Everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And that's not the only reference to the vitality which the river brings with it to wherever it flows. It reminds me of the statement that was made by our Lord Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7, where he says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures hath said, out of his belly or his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. And then John adds this parenthesis, This spake he of the Spirit that would be given after Jesus would be glorified. What a glorious spiritual parallel there is right there to Ezekiel's river. Yes, my dear people, here is life that is divine. What a promise to those who are thirsty for God and his fullness of blessing. Are you longing for an overflowing river, flowing in and flowing out? Again, Francis Botom said, in the next verse, through all my soul, its waters flow. Through all my nature, stealing. And deep within my heart, I know the consciousness of healing. And then there are levels that are deeper. You recall what I read in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, verse 3 to verse 5? He says about the progression and it's quite arresting, a thousand cubits. So that's a very interesting measurement. Two cubits make up about a yard in our old measure. So you can say about 500 yards, meters, thereabouts. He brought me through. The waters were to the ankles. And another thousand cubits. He brought me through. The waters were to the knees. Another thousand. He brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Spiritually speaking, this is an adventure of faith, stepping in and moving forward as the current constantly increases and we are led into deeper levels with God. Praise God for a life that constantly goes deeper, deeper yet I pray, and yes, and higher every day and wiser, blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word and indeed thy holy will. Some people stand on the shore and just observe from a distance. Some debate as to where it might lead. Others refuse to appropriate what is in store. But then there are others, and they step right in, and God brings them through. And we found in the narrative of revival that there were those who put themselves in the line of blessing, who stepped right in, who moved forward with God, 
who put their lives on the altar and allowed the Lord to come and do a new thing in their hearts. Well, we are all in one or other of these companies. If we choose to stay on the shore, we will be left high and dry. But if we launch out, we will discover that the blessing and walk is in the power of the blesser, the Lord himself, and in his companionship. The prophet says, he brought me through. He brought me through. In his vision, he was brought through. And the grandest level awaited him just a little further out. Because he says, then he discovered there were waters to swim in. And now we can see him in the vision and in our mind's eye, borne along on the tide of divine fullness. What a blessing. What a blessed experience in grace. Phoebe Palmer, who was sometimes referred to as the mother of American Methodism, described her experience of full salvation in these words, I felt plunged in the Godhead's deepest sea and lost in love's immensity. Isn't that a fathomless measure? Praise God today. It's not beyond the bounds of faith. And thank God today it's freely available in the finished work of the cross, in the divine infilling of the Spirit, as we put our lives in the place of blessing. Yes, indeed. And then there is dryness that is irrigated. Because we read in verse 8, the waters go down to the desert. One day a glorious river will flow from Jerusalem down the Jordan Valley, through that now arid desert, and it will become like the Garden of Eden. And the Dead Sea will be no longer dead, but bursting with life. You know, drought and dryness in the scriptures are associated with a dysfunctional Christianity. The lack of vigorous, attractive, fruitful Christian experience is widespread. Yet God says, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. You can see how it's personalized in the opening part of the verse. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. And of course, being inundated with the blessing of divine fullness, then floods are upon the dry ground because there is a irrigation of all that is around. He can make a way in the wilderness, the Bible says. He can create streams in the desert, indeed in the desert of our hearts, dry and uh, needing reviving. Yes, indeed, revival has been spoken as God's river in spate. That lovely hymn, to quote another verse, the barren wastes, are fruitful lands, the desert blooms with roses, and he the glory of all lands, his lovely face discloses. Can you relate this to your heart? You know, revival and full salvation experience are likened to and associated with the river of the Spirit. Thomas Cook, that great and noted writer and preacher in early Methodist times, said, Spirit-filled believers carry life and satisfaction and gladness wherever they go. Their presence is life-giving, fruitful and refreshing, even as a river which blesses as it flows. And there is one further property to the river that I want to mention briefly, and it is there are fish that are harvested. Because in verses 9 and 10 we read, And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. And it talks about the fishers being on the sides of the, of the sea, at En Gedi to En Eglium. And I've been there. There is a literal place. Yes, En Gedi is there right now. But one day, instead of being a salt marsh and a dead sea, it will be a living, vibrant waterway and place, exceeding many fish. Spiritually speaking, our lives can become like that. The impact of the river resulted in the harvesting of fish where there had been nothing but death. And so it has been when God's river begins to flow in revival. 
You heard Mr. Stewart say that some hundred thousand souls at least were led to Jesus Christ and brought into the kingdom of God. And of course, the Lord's people were mightily revived. And that was spoken about a little earlier on, all in the space of a year, 1859. No wonder it was called the year of grace. If there is to be any appreciable change in the present barrenness, any reversal of the lack of productivity in the realm of Christian activity, it will be due to the power of the Spirit on the people of God. He is the living, flowing, life-imparting power in action that can touch and impact the world around us. How we long for such a time of visitation again. May it begin in our own hearts. I think it was Charles Finney who said, Revival is the beginning of a new obedience to God in the heart of the individual. Someone else said, we need to draw a circle and stand inside it and say, Lord, send revival and let it begin within this circle. There is a final question. The perception of the river. Verse 6, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Have you seen this? Have you been listening? Have you been following? Have you been feeling? Have you been thirsting? Oh, my dear people, it's true that we can be looking, but not seeing. We can be hearing, but not listening. There may be messages reaching our mind, our brain, but not engaging our hearts. It needs to go to the heart. And the sad result is that if it doesn't reach the heart, there's no real change. No larger life in the spirit. No levels that are deeper. No dryness that is irrigated. No fish that are being harvested. It's just like those areas in our Bible passage that were bypassed. And instead of being healed, they were given to salt. Francis Ridley Havergill wrote some beautiful songs. And one of her songs is Like a River Glorious. But she tells in her account of her experience of God that she experienced the new birth in 1851. Twenty-two years later, she read a little booklet, All for Jesus. It was Advent Sunday in 1873, and she records in these words, I first saw clearly the blessedness of true consecration. I saw it as a flash of electric light. There must be full surrender before there can be full blessedness. God admits you by the one into the other. I saw most clearly the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. And then these expressive words, I see it all and I have the blessing. And then she wrote the hymn that became one of Thomas Cook's favorite hymns, Savior to thee, my soul looks up. My present Saviour Thou, in all the confidence of hope, I claim and I have the blessing now. Yes, my dear friends, today there is a river. Have you seen it? Will you launch out on the waters to swim in? Cut away the shorelines and let go and let God of His way in your heart. Put your life on the altar for God. Let Him come in living torrents of blessing down upon your soul. Lift the floodgates, Lord. Oh, lift the floodgates. Let the tide come sweeping in. Blessed tide of full salvation, washing, cleansing from all sin. Oh, may the Lord bless his word to your hearts today. We're going to conclude with a song by the McCausland family. Ho, oh, everyone that is thirsty in spirit. Oh, everyone that is thirsty in spirit, oh, everyone that is weary and sad, come to the fountain, there's fullness in Jesus. All oh, that you're longing for, come and be glad. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. I will pour floods of 
upon the dry ground. Open your heart for the gift I am bringing. While you are seeking me, I will be found. Child of the world, are you tired of your bondage? Weary of earth's joy, so false, so untrue. Thirsting for God and His goodness of blessing. Listen to the promise, a message for you. Child of the kingdom, be filled with the Spirit. Nothing but fullness thy longing can meet. Tis the enjoyment for life and for service. Thine is the promise so certain, so sweet. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. I will pour floods upon the dry ground. Open your heart for the gift I am bringing. While ye are seeking me, I will be found. While ye are seeking me, I will be Now, there's so much there today to challenge our hearts and indeed inundate our lives for the Lord and for his glory as the people of God. God bless you each one and be with you until we present our next program. Eric Stewart saying bye-bye. <music>